Hi folks, this podcast is brought to you through the support of listeners just like you. You can get behind this podcast today by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Patrons receive lots of extra content, including early access to each show, episode guides and much more. Support your history today by becoming a patron at Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Irish podcast. Patrons also get a shout out in the show. So today I want to thank Roy O'Flaherty, Krista Phillips, Diane Amdor, John Looney and Maria Brady. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is On the Verge of Disaster, Ireland, 1845, The Great Famine, Part 4. 1845 is famous for one thing in Irish history, the beginning of the Great Famine. However, contrary to what you might expect, if you lived in Ireland through most of 1845, there was little evidence to suggest Irish society stood on the verge of one of the greatest famines in history. As we will see, there were problems, sure enough, but there was also signs that life was actually improving. This podcast looks at life in Ireland during the last 12 months before the famine by following a much overlooked figure in Irish history, the Lord Lieutenant of the Day, William Accord, who arrived in Ireland in 1844. Given he was the Lord Lieutenant, or representative of the British government, for the first two years of the Great Famine, it's important to introduce this character. This show also explains the most notorious legislation enacted in the 1840s, that is, the Poor Law, under which Ireland's infamous workhouses were built. Don't worry if you don't know what that means, it's all explained in this show. Finally, before we begin, this episode is a bit later than expected for two reasons. So firstly, as I mentioned in the last podcast, I have been a bit sick of late, so that slowed me down. However, I also spent a bit longer on this show, as I wanted to use even more original and archival sources. So this included things like the Economist magazine archive, which proved really insightful for this podcast, along with dozens of other newspapers, personal letters and diaries. Anyway, hopefully it was worth the wait. If you want, you can let me know at history at irishhistorypodcast.ie. On July 10th, 1844, the seasoned diplomat, William McCourt, better known by his grander title, Baron Hewtsbury, travelled to Buckingham Palace, London, for the confirmation of his latest position. While political appointments were ultimately the prerogative of the government, Hewtsbury still had to appear before Queen Victoria, who confirmed him as the new Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, that is, the senior representative of the British government on the island. This posting was just the latest in Hewtsbury's long and distinguished career. Since the early years of the 19th century, he had served Britain in Italy, the Austrian Empire, Spain, Portugal and Russia. However, even for a man of such experience, Ireland was going to be a challenge. Irish society in the 1840s was an enigma to many. It was a world full of contradictions that confounded people at every turn. As we saw in the last episode, its people may have been poor, but by and large they were among some of the healthiest in Europe. Travellers to the island often noted that the people may have been dressed in rags, yet they appeared happy. This almost schizophrenic view of Ireland was common. Even if Hewtsbury had sought out the opinions of Irish people at the time, many would have offered a similar view. Even the well-known Irish writer of the day, Anna Maria Hall, struggled to define Irish life with any consistency. In the introduction to her 1829 sketches of Irish character, she warned potential visitors to Ireland, if you look for filthy cabins and a miserable peasantry who are strangers to industry and contentment, you will be equally mistaken. While this was among the more positive views of Ireland, the same Anna Maria Hall herself presented a much more negative opinion in a later book, Lights and Shadows of Irish Life. She explained her choice of the title Lights and Shadows in the following terms. The delight I experienced at once again standing on Ireland's ground was more than calmed by the misery which the poorer classes exhibit. My stories, therefore, have far more shadows than lights. For Baron Hewtsbury, travelling to Ireland, it was the latter opinion of Anna Maria Hall that was perhaps the most insightful. As 1845 approached, Ireland had both negative shadows and positive lights that coexisted side by side, making the island very difficult to understand. It was far from ideal, 
but neither was it the land of eternal misery that many English visitors were prone to labelling it as. Nevertheless, it was still going to be a challenge for Hewtesbury, because as he prepared to cross the Irish Sea, it appeared that it was the dark shadows that were in the ascendancy and were dominating life on the island. When Hewtesbury met the Queen in the splendour of Buckingham Palace on July 10th, 1844, Ireland was bracing itself for one of the tensest days of the year, July the 12th, when what was one of Ireland's most consistent problems took centre stage. On that day, each year, tensions between Catholics and Protestants, a constant feature of life in Ireland, reached fever pitch. The 12th marked the anniversary of the Battle of the Boyne in 1688, when William of Orange triumphed over James II, a defeat that symbolised the subjugation of Irish Catholics. While much had changed since 1688, including the granting of Catholic emancipation in 1829, which ended legal discrimination, the sectarian Orange Order and its members, called Orange Men, in memory of William of Orange, continued to celebrate the victory at the Boyne in highly provocative parades frequently marred by violence. While these were a constant reminder of the tensions at the heart of Irish life, the parades of 1844 passed off somewhat peacefully, In the various incidents, only one person was killed when an Orange Order parade in Ballymena County Antrim turned into a riot, resulting in the death of a man called Craig. However, Hewtesbury was well aware that sectarian feeling was neither limited to the Orange Order nor July the 12th. Indeed, many of the elite in British society held similar views towards Irish Catholics. The very reason he had been dispatched to Ireland was in part at least because of the extreme sectarian views of his predecessor as Lord Lieutenant, Earl Thomas de Grey. De Grey had been entirely unsuitable for the post given his close personal links to the sectarian Orange Order. His brother-in-law was one of Ireland's leading Orangemen. On an island where 75% of the population were Roman Catholic, his hatred of Catholics, by no means unusual in England, inevitably caused problems particularly given the Prime Minister of the day, Robert Peel, was moving towards a more conciliatory approach to Irish Catholics in general. Under the influence of his wife and in-laws, de Grey blocked Catholic appointments during his tenure as Lord Lieutenant. Such was his obstinacy on the issue of Catholicism that the Prime Minister, Robert Peel, eventually had to recall him in favour of Hewtesbury, who he felt could enact the more conciliatory policy. While sectarianism may have been to the fore in July 1844, it was by no means the only shadow hanging over life in Ireland when Hewtesbury arrived. The great political crisis of the decade, perhaps the century so far, had reached its zenith only months earlier. Some even said it could have threatened civil war in Ireland in late 1843, and it had by no means gone away. This was the great issue of repeal, repeal of the Act of Union. It was in mid-July 1844 that Hewtesbury's predecessor, Earl Thomas de Grey, left Dublin, but the man had caused more controversy in his three years in office than perhaps any other Lord Lieutenant in living memory. There were few sorry to see the back of the man. The Dublin-based Freeman's Journal proclaimed, It is difficult to conceive of a man less fitted than Lord de Grey for the office, while the Manchester Guardian stated, No friend of Ireland can regret the termination. In Dublin, the departure of de Grey was greeted with a bizarre series of jovial protests. As his carriage wound its way through the streets of the city on July the 19th, groups gathered at various points along the route. Bizarre cries of shin of beef were howled at de Grey's carriage from these crowds who also held up pieces of shin beef. This referenced an insulting gesture de Grey had made at Christmas 1843 when he sent small portions of this tough cut of meat to the Mendicity Institute in Dublin who were struggling to provide food at the time for thousands of destitute Dubliners. However, ultimately, the root of disdain many felt towards de Grey was neither this ill-conceived and out-of-touch gesture nor even his connections to the Orange Order. It was related to the political controversy of the day around the Act of Union. The years 1842 to 1843 had seen the emergence of one of the largest protest movements in Irish history. This movement demanded a repeal or reversal of the Act of Union, the legislation that had seen Ireland's Parliament abolished and the island ruled directly from Westminster since 1801. This is covered in Part 1. Although over 40 years had come and gone since the Act of Union, the controversy surrounding it had remained. 
As we have seen in previous shows, the projected economic growth that many claimed would spring from the Union for Ireland had never materialised. The failures of Union with Britain were evident for all to see by the 1840s, when Francis Williams Wynne, a British aristocrat, visited Ireland in 1841, she reflected, after her arrival in Dublin, I ceased to wonder at the eagerness of the people for repeal when I saw the magnificent houses unoccupied by nobles of the land, converted into hotels, warehouses, public offices, etc. The fine streets looking deserted, grass growing in many of them. I felt it not unnatural that the common people should imagine that if their peers and commoners had a parliament of their own to attend, instead of coming to London, their houses would be once more inhabited, streets would be filled, trade would flourish. It can hardly have surprised many, therefore, that a couple of years later, the issue of repeal exploded onto the political scene in a campaign led by the Irish MP Daniel O'Connell. Under the banner of the Loyal Repeal Association, O'Connell organised what were called monster meetings, some of which were attended by hundreds of thousands of people. The demand was simple. They did not want total independence, but instead a parliament in Dublin, which would give Irish MPs greater control over Irish affairs. Even though this movement was entirely peaceful, and what some might say overly peaceful, it still unnerved both the Prime Minister in England, Robert Peel, and the then Lord Lieutenant, Earl Thomas de Grey, in Dublin. The Manchester Guardian had voiced fears of many of the Irish and British elite when they said that the movement for repeal, despite being peaceful, was water boiling in the great political cauldron, generating and condensing steam for the grand insurrectionary explosion. The chief engineer may hope to control his fearful and expansive element, but once the steam has attained a certain force, it will burst the boilers and expand destruction in every direction. Holding similar views, the Prime Minister, Robert Peel, and the Lord Lieutenant, Thomas de Grey, decided to crack down. Thousands of troops were shipped to Ireland to deal with any potential trouble. In late 1843, the issue reached a crisis point when O'Connell and his repeal association called a monster meeting at Clontarf just outside Dublin. O'Connell, always a man with one eye on history, chose Clontarf because, and those of you who have listened to my earlier series on medieval history will know, this was the site of a famous victory for the medieval High King, Brian Boru, back in 1014. The prospect of as many as half a million people gathering on this site for a political meeting was too much for the authorities. The Lord Lieutenant Thomas de Grey banned the meeting and warned if it went ahead he would use a force of 3,500 soldiers and police supported by four field guns to break up the meeting. Daniel O'Connell had good reason to believe that a man like de Grey would follow through on this threat, particularly given the repeal movement was largely Catholic. Therefore, after some consideration, O'Connell backed down and cancelled the meeting. This was followed by the arrest of the 66-year-old Daniel O'Connell, who was convicted of sedition and imprisoned for several months. This controversy had done little to endear de Grey to a population who already disliked him, and unsurprisingly, his departure from Dublin was not mourned. However, the repeal issue did not die immediately, and it still dominated the political scene when Baron Hewtsbury arrived in Dublin. In fact, a gambler would have gotten pretty poor odds that anything could supplant the repeal issue as the hot political topic for Hewtsbury's term as Lord Lieutenant. Manny predicted it would cause him untold trouble. Next, we're going to take a quick break before we look at Hewtsbury's arrival in Dublin to take up office, which proved far easier, initially at least, than Manny expected. Indeed, he arrived in Ireland at the perfect time. The positive aspects or lights that the writer Anna Maria Hall had spoken of we're on full show, but first I'm going to take that quick break. It was a beautiful sunny late July morning when William McCourt, known as Baron Hewsbury, eventually arrived in Dublin. He had travelled over from Liverpool on the steamer Merlin the night before to arrive in Kingston Harbour, a few miles south of Dublin, where he was greeted with the pomp afforded to all new Lord's Lieutenant. Hewtsbury emerged from the steamer, suitably dressed for the occasion. Newspaper reporters were impressed by his blue frock coat, covering a white waistcoat, and what they called black unmentionables, a euphemistic term to describe trousers in the Victorian age that found even that word too explicit to mention. However, as the new Lord Lieutenant appeared on the quayside, 
he wasn't what many expected. Given Ireland was a tough posting at the best of times, the appearance of a 65-year-old man described as considerably advanced in years, of slight frame and rather diminutive otherwise in stature, probably surprised many. Undoubtedly, they expected a more sprightly, perhaps younger, individual. On his first day in the job, Youthsbury saw little of the shadows that haunted Irish life, although, as an experienced diplomat, he was probably well aware that such first days were invariably occupied with ceremony and spectacle. From his steamship he was led down the quay between two lines of Royal Marines towards an awaiting train, something of a rarity in Ireland in 1844, on a train journey lasting all of nine minutes which took him from Kingstown into Dublin. He travelled one-tenth of Ireland's entire railway network for the time, which amounted to only a hundred kilometres of track. Arriving in Westland Row Station in the city, notables from Dublin society gathered to welcome him. As was customary, the Lord Mayor of the city presented Hewtesbury with the keys to the city on a scarlet velvet cushion, which he then returned in a symbolic gesture. While there had been a major mobilisation of soldiers and police in the city to protect him, there was little need for such precautions. The crowd was neither boisterous nor large as he took the short trip from the station to Dublin Castle. On reaching the castle he was treated to more official ceremonies after which Heathsbury finally drew the day to a close and headed off to his residence in the Phoenix Park. The day as a whole had been uneventful and peaceful. The only incident of note had occurred when Heathsbury's cortege entered Dublin Castle and a young man cried out, Three cheers for Queen O'Connell and repeal! However, this hardly amounted to what anyone could call a protest and provoked little more than supportive cheers and unimpressed groans from the assembled crowd. Indeed, in the following months, Hewtesbury enjoyed a remarkably calm opening year in office. The shadows of sectarianism and the controversy around repeal that had haunted the term of his predecessors seemed to fade. If anything, late 1844 and early 1845 was a year when the lights of Ireland that Anna Maria Hall had spoken of were on show. Initially, few would have banked on Hewtesbury being a successful Lord Lieutenant. In many respects, he faced an unwinnable situation. The Freeman's Journal had proclaimed his tenure would be worthless if he did not deliver a repeal of the Act of Union, while the pro-Union press proclaimed, the first business that awaits Baron Hewtesbury's hand after his arrival in this country is the suppression of the Repeal Association. However, it soon proved he had arrived in office at the perfect time. Taking over from the highly unpopular Earl Thomas de Grey was never a bad way to start a job. No matter what he did, he couldn't be worse than his predecessor. However, at the same time, he benefited from Thomas de Grey's unpopular measures, most notably his attack on the Repeal Movement, which had a lasting impact. Through 1844 and early 1845, Hewtesbury was able to build on this attack and kill off the repeal movement by adopting much softer and popular measures. He did this by successfully exacerbating tensions within the repeal movement by granting several concessions to Irish Catholics, who by and large were the backbone of that movement. Divided and on the back foot by 1845, the repeal movement went into decline. Aside from essentially defeating the repeal movement, Hewtesbury seemed to be lucky in general. While he was in power, one of the most comprehensive and long-awaited pieces of legislation to be introduced into Ireland was being rolled out. This was known as the Poor Law and indeed would have a greater impact on the lives of Irish people probably than any other single law. Given it is integral to the story of the famine, I'm going to take a sizable detour to explain the poor law before I come back to Hewtesbury and see how it affected his tenure in office. So one of the great changes to take hold in the early 19th century was how the poor were viewed by wider society. While these began as developments in England, it led to profound changes in Ireland and potentially major headaches for the likes of Baron Hewtesbury as soon as he landed. In England, the poor had long been offered support, or relief as it was called, under a series of laws which dated back to the 16th century. However, by the 19th century, these were completely outdated and needed a total overhaul. While this took place in the 1830s, the changes were inspired by the writings of a man called Thomas Malthus and a generation of thinkers influenced by him. Their views were extreme, to say the least. They didn't believe in Christian charity. The poor, in their view, were not people down on their luck that should be helped, but instead were the architects of their own misery. Malthus and his followers argued that 
providing aid or poor relief as it was known, only encouraged those in poverty to have large families, which ultimately, they argued, served to create even greater numbers of poor people. In their ideal situation, they believed the government should provide no relief whatsoever, even if it meant people starving. Malthus and his followers had a huge influence on the 1834 Poor Law. Under its terms, it would become increasingly difficult and indeed humiliating for the poor to access relief, which was to be in the main distributed through buildings called workhouses. Workhouses, which will feature in many future shows, were bleak prison-like complexes. Inside, the poor were subjected to a rigorous, harsh and oppressive regime. Men were separated from women and children from their parents. On entering these buildings, the poor were referred to as inmates, a term that reflected how they were viewed. The whole purpose was to discourage people from entering these buildings unless they were truly desperate. When a poor law came into effect in Britain in 1834, the government then turned its attention to the far more controversial application of this system to Ireland, where the situation was very different. There had never been a poor law in Ireland at all. Everything was left to private charity, while occasionally the authorities in Dublin intervened in times of crisis. In the 1830s, it was decided that this ad hoc system would be replaced by a poor law similar to that in England. However, a report into Irish poverty in the 1830s revealed that at one time or another, up to one third of the Irish population faced poverty and potentially needed relief. It was obvious, therefore, that a policy where relief was only distributed through workhouses was not really suitable given the sheer numbers of people. However, the British establishment was largely disinterested in the complexities of Ireland. They just wanted to more or less extend the English poor law to the country. If anything, they believed an Irish poor law should be even more stringent than the English one. So, in fine political form, given the first report didn't say what they wanted, they simply commissioned a second. For this purpose, George Nichols was sent to Ireland and he announced even before he arrived that he thought the extension of the English Poor Law would work. He spent a few months on the island and then wrote a report to this effect. Even though Nichols did return to Ireland in 1837 and was concerned that his report had major flaws, it nevertheless became the basis of a Poor Law for Ireland that came into effect in 1838. It was an even more extreme version than the English Poor Law. Under its terms, Ireland was subdivided into 130 poor law unions, each one with a workhouse. Unlike England, outdoor relief, that is, relief essentially in the community, was explicitly forbidden. While some questioned the humanity of such a policy, many more wondered whether it was financially viable, given the workhouses were to run on taxes levied from the wealthy who lived in the surrounding areas. For many, this seemed unworkable. Nevertheless, in spite of these problems, construction of the workhouses began and the entire manner in which the poor received relief in Ireland was overhauled. By the time Hewtsbury enters our story in 1844, it seemed, despite the glaring problems of the poor law, it was proving to be something of a success, or at least it was working far better than its critics expected. By 1845, 123 of the 130 planned workhouses were open and able to provide relief. Furthermore, the tax to fund them was, by and large, being paid, to the surprise of many. And if Hewtsbury was called on to defend the system, he could point to the fact that in early 1845 only 42,000 people were availing of poor relief in workhouses, far less than the originally projected number. All was okay then, surely? Well, not quite. As we will see, early 1845 was not a bad year by any measure and this masked the problems inherent in the poor law system. Its architects had already admitted it would not be able to cope in a famine situation but few could envisage the horrors that serious famine coupled with mismanagement would produce in a few short years. But that's somewhat down the line in the series. To finish today, we need to look at the approaching harvest of 1845. Baron Hewtsbury had arrived in an Ireland overshadowed by problems, but through late 1844 and early 1845, he experienced few of them. Indeed, by early 1845, even the Irish economy, widely regarded as suffering from interminable problems, was showing signs of improvement. There had been food shortages in 1839 and 1842, but since then the weather had improved and harvests had been good. Ultimately, the fortunes of Ireland were inextricably linked with the harvest, and in particular the harvest of the potato crop, 
but that was now breaking new records. New potatoes, normally only ready for harvest around March, were reportedly being served at Christmas dinners in 1843. This optimism about the Irish economy continued through 1844. In July, as Hewtsbury had arrived, the Economist reported receipts taken at the port of Dublin had increased substantially in the previous year. People were spending more on luxury items such as tea, sugar, tobacco and wine, indicating there was more money in the Irish economy. There was further evidence that society was growing increasingly stable as the rates of crime and lawlessness, once synonymous with stereotypes of Ireland, were falling at an astonishing rate. There had been over 23,800 crimes prosecuted by the police in 1840. Four years later, in 1844, that had fallen to 19,400 and was continuing to fall through the course of 1845. The only year that booked this trend was 1842, but that was a year of food shortages, a subtle reminder that these increasing fortunes were not necessarily permanent, but inextricably linked to the fortunes of the wider economy and the annual harvest. Indeed, in early 1845, The Economist magazine in London fired off a warning shot to anyone getting too complacent about Ireland. It noted that Ireland's problems during a temporary prosperity may be silenced, but nevertheless exist, exist ready to break out anew whenever some comparatively trifling and temporary cause provokes to renew and activate vitality. Nevertheless, in 1845, few heeded such concerns. The predictions for the Plato harvest, essential to the overall economy, were all good. From early March onwards, newspapers carried advice for those planting the main crop and through the coming months the newspapers all contained tips and hints about how to nurture a good harvest. The only negative story came in March relating to a strange disease that had devastated the potato harvest in 1844 in parts of the United States. Scientists had by then identified this as some form of fungus, but surely that was not much to worry about. It was on the far side of the world. Indeed, in late July, the Belfast newsletter was able to quote a farmer who said, I've been many years an extensive farmer and I've travelled much throughout the south of Ireland and I have never witnessed such splendid crops, wheat, oats, potatoes and all. In a similar vein, the Freeman's Journal reported in mid-August that potatoes, already ripe in many quarters, will far exceed the average produce in the country. The weather in the late summer was perfect, with rain giving way to warmer conditions. This growing confidence was only dented in late August when stories of that disease affecting potatoes, which had so badly damaged the United States harvest of 1844, resurfaced. This time, however, it was somewhat closer to home when the Cork Examiner informed its readers a species of blight had suddenly attacked the crop in England. Affected potatoes were apparently totally destroyed. The mysterious disease had yet to procure its own name. The economists called it a potato cholera or potato plague. And although it was often called blight, this was a general term used to describe many diseases that affected plants. Alarming as this was, Ireland seemed like it was going to make a narrow escape, as the harvest season of 1845 was approaching fast. There was a certain degree of relief when the Belfast newsletter informed readers on September the 2nd that the potato crop appeared to have suffered no damage. If the disease could be held at bay for a few more weeks, the main crop, which was inextricably bound up with the fortunes of the entire island, would be saved. Then, with the harvest in view, the unthinkable happened. It was on September the 11th, 1845, that the Freeman's Journal reported, We regret to have to state that we have had communications from more than one well-informed correspondent announcing the fact of the appearance of what is called cholera in potatoes in Ireland, especially in the north. This was potentially devastating. Millions depended on the potato to survive. No one needs to state the obvious catastrophic impact a failure in the potato crop would have. The macabre terms such as the year of slaughter used by the population to describe previous famines caused by failures in the potato crop left little to the imagination as to what would result. To make matters worse, the speed at which this new disease was spreading was terrifying. The Freeman's Journal reported... In one instance, the party had been digging potatoes, the finest he had ever seen, from a particular field and a particular ridge in that field, up to Monday last. On digging in the same ridge on Tuesday, he found the tubers all blasted and unfit for the use of man or beast. Nevertheless, there was still reason to be hopeful. A race was on. If most of the potatoes could be harvested in 1845 and potentially saved from this mysterious disease, the threat might just pass. In the next episode, we will see 
what this strange disease was and whether that harvest in 1845 could be saved. Until then, Sloan. Don't forget to get that extra content by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast.